No one has ever shown the human emissions of carbon dioxide by global warming. We have a massive power and it's the power to say no. They, they put all these words on these flies and it means nothing. It's, it, it's garbage. We're all going to die! If doctors are gaslighting patients, you keep silent then this is what's going to happen. And they'll make us silent. I would rather paper cut my eyelids than have an issue <laughs> We are one people, one flag, one Australia. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Ex Candidates. My name is Stephen Tripp, joined by my good friend Adam Zara. Now Adam, how was your week, mate? Uh, my week was pretty good, thanks Stephen. How was your week going? Yeah, not too bad. We had... Uh, Rod Lampard on last week. Always uh, a pleasure. Yeah, always a pleasure, and he always uh, shares our stuff out everywhere. He wrote, you know, there was stuff in the in Cauldron Pool about us, and all. You know, he just pumps our stuff everywhere, which we really appreciate. But uh, what was your feedback on that episode? Uh, the feedback was really good. I mean, um, you know, with Rod and being on um, Cauldron Pool, the spiritual side of things, you know, like um, I guess you know, over the past few years, we've all been you know, tested in every aspect, not just, you know, physically and mentally, but spiritually as well. So it's always good to hear people with, um, you know, strong teachings and, um, you know, um, comprehend the Bible uh, very well so that, you know, you can kind of um, check your spiritual side as well. Sorry, I'm having to use headphones today because it's raining outside and the tin roof is making a lot of noise. So I'm getting also a little bit of feedback here as well. So I'm kind of like, what? What did you say? But um, <laughs> anyway, but we're all good. And um, no, it was really fun to have Rod on. And, um, you know, I'm sure we'll have him on in the future. And um, check out his stuff on Cauldron Pool, um, especially if you're really spiritual as well, because you just get that other side of things. We've got, um, you know, amazing guests that understand the mechanics and the science of things. But, um, you know, we also have guests on that understand the spiritual science of things as well, which is um, a really good rounding and grounding for everyone, I think. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we've put a lot of effort into trying to find our guests. So, uh, you know, having Rod on is, is a real privilege and it's going to be an, another privilege here tonight because we've got a very well-versed guest on. Uh, he's written prolifically on COVID and energy and climate change and a whole bunch of different areas. Uh, so we're going to try and cram all that knowledge into maybe an hour or so, uh, which which may be difficult. So maybe this will be the first of many adventures with our guests. But we have Kevin Lockery on. Now, Kevin is a uh, an, an engineer. He was also or also still currently is a lieutenant colonel, uh, technically, uh, how are you tonight, Kevin? I'm fantastic, and thanks very much, chaps, for having me on. I really appreciate it. We appreciate oh, well, having you on. on. Now, I see a lot of certificates behind you. Maybe start <laughs> off by giving the audience a background on you and maybe uh, some accomplishments and uh, you know things that you've done throughout your life. Yeah, sure. Look, I, uh, I attended the Royal Military College Duntroon, I graduated as a first lieutenant and in the process of attending the Royal Military College, I gained a degree in applied science, which then morphed into a degree in mechanical engineering with honours. Um, after that, I served for a period of 23 years in the military. Um, whilst I was at the Royal Military College, I invented a, uh, a rifle, uh, basically a, a bullpup rifle. Uh, that means that the magazine is uh, behind the pistol grip. Typically on a rifle, the magazine is in front of the pistol grip. Um, and I did that for various reasons. It's on my website. By the way, my website is kevinlockray.com.au for, for listeners who would like to go there. And if you go to past projects, you can see the sorts of things that I did in my early days. Um, Oh, there it is. And um, yeah, look, if you can click up, if you can go down to uh, past projects, uh, because the, uh, the the viewers will like this. And and now it, the second one down is um, the, sorry, the, the first one down is infantry rifle. If you click on that one, this was the first of my forays into being an inventor. You see the second button down there on the left hand yeah. side? Sorry, I've, it's opened up. Another, just give me a second. It's opened up another uh, panel. So to... <laughs> I had this trouble the other night. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Ah, technology. 
Actually, I, I was I thought it was really great that you brought it up like that. There you go. Now the top rifle is what I made at RMC. It was actually made at the Small Arms Factory Lithgow, and there's a very interesting story to that. Um, I I actually came up with this, and I went to my company commander and said, "Look, I've got an idea for a new type of rifle that will be shorter than the L1A1, which was the rifle we were using, um, but it would carry this. It would have the same uh, hitting power as the L1A1." And so as a consequence, the company commander wrote to the uh, chap who was running the workshops at RMC, and unbeknown to me, they had come to an agreement that, look, let's just humour this cadet and let him go along to a certain point and then let's shut this down. Well, they, they did exactly that, and I, I was not happy, of course, but I, I more or less just went along with it. And running home from, running back to the barracks one evening, um, I was running with a friend of mine, Rick Davies, and he said, Kev, what happened to that great idea you had for the rifle? I said, oh, look, it's pretty much dead. Uh, you know, it's been decided that they don't want to proceed. He said, he said, look, my girlfriend is the secretary for the scientific advisor of the army. Why don't you, you know, draw a few sketches, give it to me, I'll pass it on to her and she'll have a talk to the scientific advisor. And this happened and the scientific advisor said, look, would you come over and meet with me because I'm very interested in what you've drawn. This was a fellow called Max Nesbitt, an absolutely amazing, beautiful guy. I just wish there were more Max Nesbitts in the world. So I trot over to Russell offices as a cadet um, and uh, I didn't tell anybody I was going. I met with Max Nesbitt and I showed him plans I'd drawn and he, he said, well, you know, uh, General Daly, who was then the chief of the general staff, in other words, the fellow in command of the army, uh, was looking at making a new type of rifle because bad reports were coming, adverse reports were coming back from Vietnam regarding the utility of the L1A1, the self-loading rifle, 762 millimeter, And uh, they had thought of making a something similar to the AK-47, but thought that the optics of this would not be good. The AK-47 is associated with being a revolutionary's rifle, as good as it is. I have to tell you, it is a very good weapon. Um, mm. And mine may provide them with a means of making a shorter weapon with the same sort of hitting power. So it was decided that I would then liaise with the Department of Supply. And I met some truly lovely fellows over there as well. And they did a drawing uh, utilising L1A1 parts. And I was sent down to Small Arms Factory Lithgow. Where once again, I met some fantastic people. I mean, it is amazing how you run into these people and, and you become really good friends with them because they're all kindred spirits. They all want to just do something. You know, life's just humdrum and along comes this kid with an idea and it's an excuse for everybody to have fun. And I didn't want to own the idea. That's important also. And I stress that. I, I wouldn't mind anybody coming in and adding their value to it. I was just excited that, hey, we're going to do something that's really meaningful. Anyway, they made that rifle. But they going back from the scientific advisor's office, um, oh, General Daly came down, by the way, Max Nesbitt rang the, the chief of the general staff and he popped down to the office for a few moments, shook my hand and said, you know, good on your son and yada, yada, and then he left. Anyway, word got back to RMC, to the um, commandant who was a major general and to the director of military arts and uh, cadets aren't supposed to go over to Russell offices and meet with the chief of the general staff. Uh, so I was called out on parade the next morning and I thought, oh, Jesus, I'm in really serious trouble because if you got what was called a DMA talk, it meant that you were going to get on a bus and leave the college. And I was told the DMA wants to see you. So I trot down to the DMA's office and there was a Major Kelly there who was his uh, uh, personal assistant. I didn't get to see the DMA, but... Major Kelly said, oh, I, I know what this is about, Kevin. Now, look, Kevin, if you could please just let us know when you're going to go over and have a <laughs> chat with the chief of the general staff, we would be terribly grateful. And that was the end of it. So off I went. Uh, and that's how that rifle came about. And when wow. I went to um, – I, I graduated and I was posted the three-base workshop battalion – I had a marvellous uh, CEO called John Fawkes, who went on to be the director of the Royal Australian Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. Um, and he immediately said, oh, look, this is a great idea. We'll form a, an apprentice project and we'll see if we can develop your idea further. And that's the second rifle. If you could bring that up, you can see it. And then the, then the story gets really interesting. Mm -hmm. 
You see the second one underneath? Yep. And if you could, is it possible for you to scroll in to actually get in closer to it? If you can, yeah, yeah, that's better. You'll see that there is a safety catch at the front of the trigger. You see that little thing hanging down? That is actually the safety catch. And, And you cannot put your finger on the trigger without turning off the safety catch. And that is really important because there have been numerous instances of people being surprised and trying to fire their weapon while the safety catch was on, losing precious seconds and getting killed as a consequence. At the top of the rifle, you'll see behind the the rear sight, there is a lever sitting upwards, and that is the cocking lever. Now, the thing you'll notice about this rifle, and this is one of the things that I was aiming at, it is ambidextrous. And interestingly, later in life, I was um, when I was with the British Army, I got involved in training people in urban warfare for Northern Ireland. And if you're if you've got a normal weapon, you can only really fire it right-handed, or if it's been modified, you can fire it left-handed. But if you are a right-handed person and you have to fire an aimed shot around the left-hand corner, you have to expose your whole body to the enemy. You can't. You can't just take a narrow sighting. Why would you want to do that? Well, when you're in urban warfare, the last thing you want to do is shoot a civilian. And there are lots of civilians in suburbia. And the consequence of that is that you stress to people that when you're training them for urban warfare, you don't do what you sometimes see in the movie where a fellow is sitting behind a wall and he lifts his submachine gun up above the wall and just sprays mindlessly in the direction of of the fire. (laughs) Okay, what you've got to do is, with pinpoint accuracy, try to kill enemy and not hurt civilians. Very, very important. Very important, not only ethically, but also you will lose a war on public relations if you go killing civilians. Well, the problem is those those movies are made in America, so we know what the (laughs) Americans are Yeah, well, I believe they shot 20,000 rounds in Vietnam to kill one Viet Cong. So, yeah, that that gives you an idea of the expenditure. But, yeah, Yeah. so so that was part of what this rifle was all about. The other thing was that it was desired to – it was designed so that I could rechamber it to any calibre that they desired. Okay. Um, um, the, the last thing was that I, I was going to copy the AK-47's locking mechanism, which is copied from a Mauser. Kalashnikov copied the German Mauser locking action um, in order to um, just... My wife's just turned on the fan. Uh, uh, no, it's okay. Can you hear the fan going? No, it's fine. We oh, good, just... good. Well, that, and she's now going to close the door because she doesn't want to <laughs> interrupt me. Um, yeah, so um, they, it, I wanted to put an AK-47 action into the weapon. Uh, and this is also important. It is an extremely simple locking mechanism. It carries many mechanical engineering benefits, and it is far superior to the stoner system, which is used on both the Colt and the Steyr, which is a multifaceted bolt head which is very difficult and expensive to make and easy to clog. Anyway, coming back to the story, I made this this rifle at three base. It wasn't finished, but unbeknown to me, the uh, head of Army Design Establishment found out that I was making this this rifle. His name was J.C. Wisdom, and he was meeting with the head of Ramey, whose name was Dean, also J.C. Dean. We call him Jesus Christ. (laughs) Um, and uh, it was decided that the rifle was, well, firstly, uh, Wisdom got very, very upset that anybody was usurping Army Design Establishment's role and that it was totally wrong for Ramey to be building prototype rifles, um, which gives you an insight into the inflexibility and stupidity of the Army. Uh, even now, as a senior officer, I, I just find this unconscionable. When you've got a young Uh, lieutenant, very highly qualified, who's done something that potentially could be of great value to the Australian Defence Force. And instead of having the uh, flexibility to say, look, it can do no harm so long as his normal regimental duties and workshop duties are not in any way prejudiced. This, in fact, could, you know, inspire people. Other people are going to get enthusiastic about this. This will be a great morale booster. And you never know, something very good could come out of it. Now, even before then, SASR had seen my rifle and they wrote a glowing report of it. You'll find that on the website. And later, a a very good friend of mine, Pat Cullinan, who was in Special Air Services Regiment, 
organized that they look at these rifles and they wrote most favorable reports about it. Anyway, Wisdom and, and Dean then agreed that the rifle would be destroyed and all plans and all documentation would be um, would also be destroyed so that there'd be no trace of it. Um, now, a friend of mine, Mike Stark, was in fact the captain quartermaster at Three Base Workshop Battalion. He got wind of this, rang me up and said, look, they're sending Stan Whitwell out with Ian Cummings to, uh, to destroy your rifle and everything related to it. If you get it over here, I can bring it to charge. And if it's brought to charge, they then have to have a certificate of destruction and they can't get rid of that. Um, so I took the rifle over even when it was not actually finished and Mike brought it to charge. And when Stan got out there, we said, oh, look, you can't destroy it because it's actually on reg it's on the register. Um, and the only way you're going to destroy it is you have to do a border survey and there'll be a certificate of destruction. And so everything will be noted. And so Stan went back to, uh, to what was then uh, Army headquarters and said, uh, can't destroy it. By the way, Stan was very much on my side. He, he wouldn't believe this, but my next posting was SO3 weapons uh, and armament at Army headquarters, and Stan and Ian Cummings were my subordinates. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> so, and and they, they were just fabulous guys. Truly, they were terrific. They, they, they really looked after me because you might have gathered that I was somebody who um, could be a little difficult, e.g. I'm, I'm full of enthusiasm always wanting to change the world and make it better and never prepared to take no for an answer if I disagreed with where it was coming from. So they really looked after me and protected me and they gave me terrific counsel, which has lasted me for the whole of my life. Stan in particular showed me that there are many facets to a, uh, a question or a problem. Um, you know, you look at things and you think, oh, this is the answer. And then Stan would very tactfully point out all the other aspects and how I'd gotten it entirely wrong. Um, and, and that also has served me very well. So anyway, that's about the rifle. Now, while I was at RMC, I also came up with a new type of silence or a new way of suppressing muzzle blast. I was particularly interested in this because I'd found out that you can actually silence a rifle that fires a supersonic round. And when the round passes close to your ear, you become totally confused. And I, I actually stood down range. Um, I, I had a fellow minding me by the name of Sergeant Fogarty, who, thank goodness, was an expert marksman. And he would shoot at me about 300 wow. millimetres past my ear at 100 metres. And um, what happens is that the bow wave of the round hits your ear. Obviously, you hear crack. And then the bow wave bounces off uh, buildings or trees uh, after it's past your head, and that comes back on you. And so you mm. think that's the thump. And as a consequence, you think that you're being shot at by someone who's actually 180 degrees from where they really are. Uh, and, and my silencer had that effect. And oh, the, wow. the way the silencer worked was quite simply, I worked out a way by which I could divert off a certain amount of gas into side passages, and this gas would then get ahead of the bullet and then just as the bullet passed the exit points, this gas would return into the main flow against the main flow. And, and I then had side ports. So the only place the gas could go was out through the side ports. And in going out through the side ports, it would go into a long chamber, which ran back along the barrel. The reason for doing this is then my silencer only protruded about 50 millimetres over the, the length of the barrel. And in fact, this additional tube running back on your barrel steadies the jump of the barrel. And Accuracy mm. International now use that exact design. We, we now purchase Accuracy International sniper rifles and it incorporates my silencer. But a wow. number of other countries around the world have also copied this silencer. Uh, if you, Tell me if you, you had a back, patent on that. No, no, no. I, I actually had to share all of my research with uh, Rockford Arsenal in the United States because they provided me with 1000 ASA film, which allowed me using a Brule and Kerr um, microphone to very accurately um, analyze the blast waves coming from the ordnance and the various patterns. And then by using Fourier analysis, I was able to work out the components which made up that blast wave. It was all super exciting stuff. Truly, it was. It was. It was Kevin, amazing. you're describing it. You're describing a situation in the past where you had an idea, 
you presented your idea and then you tried to work with people to find the best solution possible to bring your idea to life and it was a, a process that went through you know through a whole bunch of steps but it was exciting for you it was exciting for the people around you and it evolved over time when you apply it to now when we might mm -hmm. take energy for example and we when we see the renewables that are happening you know all these wind farms going up there everywhere and solar panels and people might come along and say well we have a better idea we we, we think maybe small modular small small modular reactors are the best way to go and people just shut and oh that's too expensive it's not even worth looking at you know let's not even go there do you think things have changed over time where maybe people were more open to new ideas in the past whereas now you just get shut down straight away yeah and yes and no because you see the silencer was sent to army design establishment the same organization that demanded that all plans to my rifle and the rifle itself be destroyed and they said this silencer will never work and they gave me ten dollars for my my troubles <laughs> right. and then other countries started making the silencer so okay. we we face a problem and, and look i said i served for 23 years but then i went out into private enterprise and i deliberately planned my career. Uh, I went into large companies initially so that I could learn the rope, so to speak, learn how a company is run and all those sorts of things that I may not have been exposed to in the army. And then at the end of that, I formed my own companies. And in fact, I formed three companies. Um, but then in 2005, out of the blue, I was rung up by a chap and he said, look, we need you to come back into the army because of Afghanistan and Iraq. We need uh, chartered professional engineers, and, and they're few and far between, and you're one of them. Uh, also, with your background, you would be an ideal fit for what we've got planned. Would you come back? And so I said, yes, I'd be delighted to. Now, when I got back into the Army, all of the guys who were generals had been captains and had been junior to me, and, and some of them I knew quite personally, and they were, they were lovely people, Mark Kelly being one of them and Mark Bornholt being another, and you wouldn't believe it, but Mark was the land commander, the fellow whom I basically reported through, through the chain of command. Uh, and as soon as I came back, he shook my hand and said, oh, g'day, Kevin, it's lovely to see you back, yada, yada, yada. And Mark Bornholt had also, was, was his 2IC, and he'd also been basically under my care when we were overseas with the British Army. So, but, but the, where I'm heading to is I started looking around and all of the generals, uh, uh, most of them, I, I, I don't want to say all of them because that's most probably too absolute, but 99% of them are really decent people, but none of them have a reputation for imagination. None mm -hmm. of them. None of them have done anything significant in terms of inventing stuff, coming up with, with radically new ideas. They, these people have amazing focus. So if you want a job done, and you want a jo job done according to a cookbook recipe, e.g. we call them SOP, Standing Operating Procedures, you can be assured these people will do an exemplary job. But they are the last people you want leading an organisation. You want them to be supporting the leader because these guys, all of these generals in the and, and the admirals and the air vice marshals and so forth, they're all super steady, solid blokes but they are team players, which means they'll never object. As an example, none of them objected to all of the service members within the ADF being injected with an experimental mRNA vaccine. Yeah. And, and it's funny how the world goes, but 35 years ago, I, was I spent four years with the British Army and I was trained in biological warfare. And you wouldn't believe this, but the focus of our study was on how the common cold is spread. And mm. the common cold was considered to be an excellent candidate for biological warfare. Ba-boom, what happened? Wow. Now, now, any sensible general would say, hey, this is nuts. They would have looked into this and said, there is no way we're going to inject healthy people in the Australian Defence Force with this experimental vaccine, given that it poses absolutely no danger to anybody who is medically fit and below the age of 70. And that's what the data said in March of 2020, before the vaccine had even come about. And yet they all said, oh, 
No, we'll agree to mandates. Now, that's what you get with team players and people who have no imagination. Kevin, Our defence force is in a real bad state. Go on. Sorry. Kevin, Sorry, I've Alex. spoken, I've got, you know, I've spoken to a few people from the ADF. And when that, when the whole COVID thing came around, um, it was quite what you were saying. It was exactly like what you were saying. It was it was opposite to what would have been done in the past where generals would have questioned injecting people with this, you know. That's right. Hocus pocus. Okay. And then what happens is, um, but the opposite ha actually happened. They all got their, their their groups or their battalions or however you, you know, um, describe it. I'm not a military man. Um, they got Formation. sat down. Sorry? Formations. Uh, their they got formation. their formation, units and formations. They, yeah, that's the but, technical term, yeah. Right. So the, their units sat down and a, a, a doctor or their chief medical officer from the military from, from their area would have came down and literally scared all of the soldiers, all these fit, young, fit, healthy, quite athletic, aerobic, you know, you know the training that you've got to go through. They're all, they're, uh -huh. None of them would have got... <laughs> None of them would ever hardly get sick anyway, right? So, you right. know, like this guy's about, he's a little bit older than me and um, he would run rings around me, this guy, and he's had two knee reconstructions. So, you know what I mean? Like, so what I'm saying is that he went home and, I mean, because he was telling me a story about it, like, you know, that he was getting methylated spirits and he's wiping down all the door handles and he's cleaning down sinks and he's, you know, talking to his wife and all this kind of stuff about, you know, it's like literally scared was that was scared about this virus that was as you said in 2020 shown to not have to have minimal effect i mean everyone laughs about it now i've got a neighbor you know they 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 came down with covid again recently right and um she's like oh yeah i felt crap for a few hours and then you know and and then was kind of like you know got through that 6 hours of of just horribleness and of feeling horrible which which a common cold a chest infection, a nasal infection, an ear infection, all those things do those things to you anyway. You just want to sleep for a few hours and just kind of like get over it. But they were scared into this thing where, where you must wear a mask, you must do this, you must do that. They were wearing gloves everywhere and all this kind of stuff. I mean, we don't want to scare our military men and women into, you know, <laughs> what about, you know, about a bug, right? And they're running around wearing masks and stuff. We want to make sure that they're physically strong that they um, have the tools and equipment to handle these kind of things and know that they're going to be okay the next day. The sun's always going to come up. So, you know, um, that whole COVID thing and the way the military, um, I, from what I've heard and from what you're now saying as well, being part of the military or ADF, um, you know, it's a scary thing. I mean, it, it looks like a shambles to me. It look, they, they, the fact that the medical officers came and said that is really, really bad because... The very first thing I did was scramble for data. Initially, I thought this is really, really bad. Um, but later, I, 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 I'm wondering if I can actually share, we can share a screen and I'll show you something. But, but um, it, it might not be necessary for me to show. But videos were coming out of China where people were dropping dead in the street. Yeah. You may remember that, right? Yeah. Hmm. Well, one of these videos, when the fellow's falling, he puts his hand out to break his yeah. fall. Now, I've seen a lot of guys fall down. I've seen, you know, obviously what we call uh, operational porn where people get shot. And I can assure you any person who is unconscious does not put their hands out to break their fall. This was all contrived. And the moment that I saw that, and then the, the, by, by March of 2020, I was awake to the whole thing. Now, I am not a doctor, albeit that I wanted very much to be one, so I'm very medically tuned. My brother, my eldest brother, was a doctor. Um, so uh, by 2020, I, I knew that this was wrong, and I then Zoomed with a lovely lady called Professor Dr. Dolores Kale of Dublin University who had performed a number of experiments using mRNA and all of her animals had died. And she was saying, this is mm. nuts. There's a good chance that anybody who gets these injections, if the injection works, they'll be dead within two years. And she's not far off the mark. Well, we're now, 30%, I tell you why, aren't we? 30% excess death rate. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the, it, it, see, I became then friends with professor, Dr. Peter McCulloch as well. And, oh, yeah. and uh, if you go to my website again and you go to the COVID button, you go back to home and then go back to the COVID button. I'll yep. show you something.
that the viewers will will find interesting because this this is this further underlines what you're talking about adam yeah uh, now go back to home top top button left hand side get there now down to COVID. And now scroll right down near the bottom. Now, this is everything that you never wanted to know about COVID. Um, and, and this is all research. I've just simply you know, borrowed from all the people who know what they're talking about. Now, very near the end there, you'll see click here. If you keep on going down a little bit more, you'll see there's a blue uh, thing. See that click here? Just there. Yeah. Click here for, to read that letter. Click on that. Give me one sec. I'll just uh, change screens. Is that the one? That's the one. Now, that's a letter which was written. It actually was written early in 2021. It took me about six months to get this together. That's written. That was sent on the 21st of October 2021 uh, to the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, the Premiers, Chief Ministers, the uh, various health ministers and health officers with info copies going to every uh, police commissioner in Australia. If you could just scroll down. Scroll, just scroll down in that letter. Keep going. And and I urge people to have a read of that. But when you get there, now you'll see Professor oh, McCulloch signed that. Wow. Yeah. If you and you see Tess Laurie, she's a beautiful person. She's actually, yeah. without doubt, she is one of the most expert people on what's called evidence based medicine. Dolores Kale, an, an amazing woman, uh, a real fighter. And Dr. Robert Brennan, whom I would class as a close friend now, he's a, he's a marvellous fellow also. He got deregistered for talk, speaking out. Now, that letter was sent to 33 addressees, which are listed underneath there, by registered mail on the 21st of October 2021. We have never received a reply or acknowledgement to that letter. Tell me that the system's not broken. How yeah, could that be? Shocking. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, there's something very, very wrong. Now, if I knew that that and, and I'm just what I'm doing by showing you that letter is that I'm I'm not in any way gilding the lily or saying I knew something which I didn't know or whatever. I I was absolutely positively sure of what I was talking about. And yet the heads of the army, and even and you have to also point at the heads of intelligence, army intelligence, because this was an I this was a scheme not only to destroy this country but to destroy the ADF. Think about that for a moment. These guys went along with destroying the ADF. And, you know, I mentioned that the ADF is in a real bad shape. Mm. What, what sensible person would place all of their defence hierarchy into a cluster of buildings at Russell offices in Canberra, put an aiming mark outside those buildings in the form of the American War Memorial, which we affectionately call Bugs Bunny, Put all of your logistics hierarchy into Campbell Park, which is built in the in the, the theme of a ship. So it's just one long bombing run. And then you take all of your operational hierarchy and you place them in a building out at Bungendore, which once again could be eliminated by a drone, by, by drone strike at a distance of 5,000 kilometres. Now, the reason that Canberra, was built where it was built. It was because it was to be out of artillery range of naval shipping. Mm. So back in 1901, they were thinking about what should we do for defence? We don't want the bad guys to be able to park themselves off the coast of Australia mm. and bombard our capital. Well, now we have a defence headquarters system where we've placed everybody who commands anything, including our computer systems, into one great cluster F, and it will be destroyed. In, um, does in that flat. sound a little bit? Does that sound a little bit like um, what happened at Pearl Harbor? Kind of all yes, the ships look, in one. It, it is. Look, and, and you know, it's interesting that something like two thirds of the generals in the American Defence Forces were fired within the first year of the war. Hmm. because they had a peacetime mentality, and that's what we have now. Those people, it would do us a great deal of good to take all of those very important people and stick them into units around the country, disperse them. Yeah. And it would be no different to having the fleet admiral on the aircraft carrier and you've got a captain in charge of the aircraft carrier and the fleet admiral doesn't walk over to the captain of the aircraft carrier and tell him how to run his carrier. 
Well, if you place, for example, the chief of the army with the, for example, the uh, commander of the first division at Inogra, he, the chief of the army would not or should not go across and try to tell the major general running the division how to do his job. But even then, I would get rid of Inogra barracks. I'd, I'd be looking at dispersing all of our defence installations as much as I could around Australia so that we do not present a target. Another thing they've done is they've put most of the useful operational assets up around Darwin and Tyndall, which is lunacy. Yeah, I, I used to be in combat development, and, and it China? would be very easy for and we played war games. It would be very easy for someone to land a division of paratroopers at Tyndall and completely take out all of our useful operational assets just before the wet season, because once the wet season hits, you can't get to them. So they've then effectively established a foothold on Australia because they would then control the straits between Darwin and Indonesia and, and New Guinea, of course. Nobody could interfere with, the, nobody could interdict their line of supply. You've got, you know, we are dealing with people who have no imagination, who are still back in the Second World War thinking in terms of capabilities of Second World War material. That, I mean, I could go no. on and on. We have, Kevin, we have two computer systems, and, and you would be gobsmacked at how stupid those computer systems are. Anyway, sorry. We, we, no, no. Kevin, I did got... say that he wanted me to sort of go off. In no, go for it. No, well, I'm, no I'm, not, I'm not even trying to cut you off. And what I'm, trying to, what I'm going to do is we've got some questions coming in, and um, we know that you – and we've really established how um, strong your background is. So things that you do talk about – um, a well, you know, educated, um, well-researched, um, you know, comments, papers, what have you, your opinions are quite valid, you know, um, and we're showing, um, you know, how, like, obviously um, intelligent you are on the mechanical engineering side and things like that. But we do have um, a very good um, supporter of ours, um, Sasha, and she's asked a question. And I'm going to ask this question now because I'm also interested. And it's okay if you don't know. Um, just say, I don't know, um, but course, I'm sure it might interest you. Yeah. Um, so she's just wondering if you know anything about the effects of 5G frequency, that's at 5G frequency on humans. No, um, but I can, I can add a little bit to this. I was involved in the development of world first radio frequency identification devices. I when, this is the, you'll, I'll sound like a stuck record, but I was just surrounded by the most marvelous people, a fellow called Graham Murdoch. And, and um, I'm trying to think of the names of the other fellow now, but anyway, they, they were just terrific. They, they were brilliant people. And, and we decided that we would look at using 13.56 megahertz, which is in what's called the industrial scientific and medicine, medical bandwidth. Uh, you don't have to have a license and you could, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, transmit at a fairly high power level. Um, we were planning on using these tags on pathology samples. And so the obvious question is, is it possible that um, electromagnetic radiation, high frequency electromagnetic radiation would alter the pathology? And we tried this out uh, using pathology samples in 13.56 and we did it to ridiculous levels and it didn't do anything. Um, but the answer to your question is that no, I don't know. And what's more, if I were king, I wouldn't use it until I had thoroughly, and I mean really thoroughly, researched it. This is another case of where we're experimenting on the public, and I yep. totally disapprove of it. I hope my that helps. My understanding of, sorry, Stephen, my understanding of the 5G and the frequencies are is that when we use a long wave, it can't penetrate the human cell. But when we use a microwave, it can penetrate the cell. And that's where the issue lies because 5G is a microwave compared to 4G where it's a mid-wave, which wasn't quite, it's not It's not a long wave and it's not a short wave. Oh, it's, well, it's okay. a short wave, but it's not a microwave. I, I feel like Stan Whitwell here, but no, long waves actually penetrate the cells easily right. and, and they use long wave for submarine communications because it okay. does pass through, for example, water medium. Short waves don't, but 
Um, if you are broadcasting at the resonant frequency of water, which is what most cells are comprised of, then you end up with resonance. And that is exactly how a microwave oven works. And it is quite possible that if, if 5G is at a harmonic of, um, you know, a, a resonant frequency for human uh, cytoplasm, for the human uh, biomass, then you could do great damage. Short waves don't have good penetration through watery masses typically. They don't pass through wet leaves, for example. That's why when it's raining, your internet could drop out if you're using, uh, you know, wireless internet, NBN wireless internet. Um, the, the, the rain and fog will interfere with the ability of microwaves to pass through it. Excellent. So, but look, I think we really, the message here is I, I, I don't know, truly, I don't know, and I don't think anybody else does, no. and that really worries me that they're, <laughs> the that they're rolling this out. <laughs> Let's do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and look, there is the possibility if they're running at the resonant frequency you could do all sorts of really awful things. And there's a theory running around that if during cell division, um, the electromagnetic radiation interferes with your DNA, with basically your chemicals, um, that you may end up with an ill-defined cell. And if that should happen, and if, for example, your ability to perform what's called autophage in your body, you have these uh, macrophytes which are, which are running around and they can identify cells which are not quite right, and they engulf them. Um, but uh, and this is called autophage. This is where your body actually eats bad things. Um, if you're for some reason run down or whatever, and you have an ill-defined cell, uh, and it will grow then into a neoplasm, into a cancer, uh, you could be in real strife. So I I would really really love for us to examine this exhaustively. I'm very happy with 4G. And by the way, I'm not even that comfortable with 4G, to be truthful, because uh, I don't believe it's been properly tested. But it's here. We're using it. Uh, and people aren't, you know, the life expectancy isn't dropping off except for COVID and mRNA injections. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we ought to just stick at 4G for a little while and really exhaustively test these before we go rolling them out. Kevin, I, I want to shift gears a little bit because... One thing that really worries me is the, the younger generations coming through and what they're being indoctrinated with in the schools. I wouldn't even really class it as education, what they're teaching them in the schools. But, uh, you know, we speak to gentlemen like yourself. You have a, a few more gray hairs than what Adam and I do. So I still got there. <laughs> just, just, a little, just, a, just a little bit, right? But I was at a conference a couple of weekends ago. It was the Australians for Science and Freedom. And one lady that got up, she was speaking about marketing and selling a message to people. And she was relating it to Marxism. And she was bringing up a whole bunch of issues such as transgenderism, you know, renewable energy, uh, the COVID pandemic. And what she was saying was it's taking our focus off issues that we really should be focusing on. So we're, we're, we're being distracted by drag queen story time where we probably should be focusing on what are we going to do about water here? Why aren't we building dams? Why aren't we looking for nuclear energy, <laughs> right? That's what I want to pick your brain about because I, I can see, yeah. you know, that you've got a lot of experience and, uh, you know, you were an innovator, with, you know, when you're talking about weaponry and different things. If if you could look at Australia and say, okay, what do we need to do if we if, for for long term nation building projects in this country to really develop our society, but also strengthen our national security and all all sorts of things? What do we need to be looking at in Australia? What are some of the solutions that we need to be focusing on? Well, the, the very first thing and most easily achievable is that we ought to take municipal waste and using a technology which has been developed by the University of Queensland and with which I've been vicariously involved and that I know works, and the chap running this is Dr. Victor Randolph, um, they have developed a, a very, very clever catalytic conversion technique which can take carbonaceous waste directly through to liquid fuel. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm thinking that time is short and I want to keep, I don't want to lose the audience, but the Germans developed a system of converting coal into liquid fuel called the Fischer-Tropsch process. And the way it works is they take coal, they mix water to it, 
they heat it up to an incredible temperature, e.g. 600 degrees centigrade, where the water then reduces the coal to carbon monoxide and to hydrogen gas. They then take that through and they turn that into paraffin wax effectively. Then the paraffin wax using conventional refinery techniques is cracked down to diesel and then hexanes and various other components. So you can create diesel, you can create aviation turbine fuel, and you could create gasoline for cars. Now, that's the Fischer-Tropsch process. What these chaps up in... Um, is is the that similar to what the Germans were doing during World War II? Absolutely. That's it. Yeah, and that's what Sasoil use, and Sasoil have refined this. They've done a fantastic job. Sasoil are in South Africa, and they actually take coal and turn it into liquid fuel. But where the University of Queensland has gone one step further is they don't have to turn it into paraffin wax and then break it down. What they've done is come up with catalysts that can take the syngas, that's that hydrogen and carbon monoxide, and turn it immediately to gasoline and to kerosene uh, and pure carbon black, but that's another story. We won't go there. It, it, it's very interesting to me and to other people. Um, but, but importantly, this country only has 24 days of liquid fuel. And a friend of mine, Major General Jim Molan, who's subsequently sadly deceased and who was a senator, he and I both shared a great deal of angst about the fact that we only have 24 days of fuel in this country. The government's solution to this was to ask the Americans to store the reserve for us on the other side of the world in caverns, as if we're going to get to that should there yeah. be an emergency. As if they'd right? let us have now, it. Yeah. Now, if you go into my webpage again and you'll find ideas and opinions and you can go to waste to liquid fuel, uh, viewers can have a look at that. What I want to do and I, I would, I've, we've already tried to get the Liberal government, when it was the government, interested in this. It went to uh, Angus Taylor. Jim oh, yeah. took it to Angus Taylor. And he said, oh, too technical for me. And flicked it across to Susan Lay, who was the Minister for the Environment. She looked at this and said, oh, I can't handle this. And she gave it to her sidekick, Elizabeth Warner, who rang me and said, look, it's all too complicated for us, but what we can do is tell you where you can get grants. And if you can provide dollar for dollar, you could try and build this. And I said, that, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not trying to, to, I'm not trying to find a job here. I'm trying to find a solution to a critical problem, a mm. critical strategic problem. Now, I've done a back of the cigarette paper type, and I don't smoke, um, calculation. And on the basis of the energy that is in Australia's municipal waste, it would appear that using the Queensland process, we could produce twice the liquid fuel that we presently use domestically, aviation gas, uh, aviation turbine fuel and dieselene. We could produce twice what we're presently using by simply taking municipal waste and, and putting it through this process. If you read my paper, there are, there are interesting things. And yes, sorry, Adam, you were going to no, say. No, that's right. So I'm just going to make I'm just going to simplify this for people like myself quite lay right. Yeah. Taking garbage out of the tip and then turning it into liquid fuel. Yes. Okay. And at the same so, time extracting all the useful stuff, the ferrous and non-ferrous, the glass uh, out of it, but but the paper, the plastic, the grass clippings, wood all get turned into liquid fuel. Would that mean we'd be able to use plastic straws again and then when we use them as waste, we could Absolutely. turn them into liquid fuel? There's no reason why we shouldn't have been using them all along. Ah, but, okay, hold on a but, second because yes. i got more on this then, okay, people. So that means that we could, re instead of using paper bags from Woolworths and Coles and all those places, we could use plastic bags and then we could Absolutely. actually turn them into liquid fuel. Absolutely. And what's more, you would not need to sort your garbage into recyclables and normal waste, which, by the way, if you think of the amount of labour that is involved in that, every household's doing this. You, yeah. If you add that up, it is a huge impost on your society. Yeah, and well, again, here, 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 in, here in, the northern, in the northern beaches, we have four different bins. The three. Well, that's crazy. That's crazy. You see, your compost could go into a similar bin. So you might need more than one bin because of the size of your waste. But all carbonaceous material goes into this. Now, the Swedes actually take all the garbage from Finland and from Norway and they make, it's in my paper, it could be 300, 
100 million pounds a year they make by taking this garbage and only 3% of it ends up in landfill and they produce a squillion in energy. They actually right, create you've energy. Here, you've heard it here. Well, you've heard it here first, even though it's an old idea that, let's, let's face it, the Germans used. Um, but you've heard it here first that we could actually, instead of spending trillions of dollars on intermittent energy and what I call fake renewables, because we know that wind's renewable, we know the sun's renewable, we know all that, but the problem is turning it into energy that we can use is not renewable, okay? We could actually go and get, let's say, let's say you know, Garbage Island, which is the size of a small city floating around in the ocean. Yes. Yes. Get rid of pollution in the ocean by retrieving Garbage Island, okay, yep. and then turn it into liquid fuel. Yes, and then power our homes. And you haven't asked do, me how much does the liquid fuel cost. Oh well, we'll, we'll get there. How much does the liquid fuel cost? <laughs> Thirty cents a liter. <sighs> and you can, can run this in cars. Absolutely. In fact, it's purer. There's no, there's no sulfur dioxide. There's no sulfur. There's no impurities. It is absolutely pure. That would Kevin. work really well for a direct injection engine because I have carbon built up absolutely. in my Audi 4.2 liter engine. Yeah, yeah. And then I absolutely. have to get that clean. It cost me a fortune to get that cleaned every 100,000 yeah. Ks. Yeah. Now, that, that, this has been developed by the University of Queensland. And when you give it to your government, your government says, oh, it's too difficult. Now, that's why we, you know, we, we're going to go very briefly our system of government is absolutely broken yeah. because we take nitwits who were elected on quite specious criteria. They get elected. And then from this basically bunch of fools, we select a few, something in the order of 16, who become cabinet ministers. And that's the executive arm of your government. It's run by idiots. It's tantamount to getting... Somebody at getting a high school student at random, taking them out of high school and saying, look, we'll let you run BHP for a year. It'll, it'll be right. You, you've got all these other people who will help you with it. The, the, the problem, and Kevin, is... That's what is we that, do in government. That's why yeah. our country is going up the S Creek without a paddle. Well, well the, the big problem is with these two major parties is that they're so torn apart by factional infighting. They know if they were to take the giant leap and embrace an idea like this, they'd get shot down from the other side within their own party uh, straight away. But, but you see, they're morons. You've got, to, you've got to understand that they are morons because mm. if they were half intelligent, they would be, and I'm not saying I'm half intelligent. I'm, I'm more than half intelligent. No, you're more but, half intelligent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but picture me. I would tear them a new basic orifice if someone tried to tell me what I'm saying doesn't work. But well, I'm, you assuming, know, I, I'm assuming they can't this... argue. They can't argue because they are inept. They are uh, totally technologically illiterate. They are fools. Uh, I'm assuming they, they are they, fools. I think that they know. I think that they think that they know about stuff, but they're not willing to listen to anybody else. Whereas, like you're talking about nitwits getting picked and you know running on. So yeah. Stephen and I. I consider myself, and well, I'm lumping you in this in this pile as well. We're nitwits, and we ran for we ran for you know our various areas, uh, state and federally. Okay, but I think I'm I'm one I'm a kind of person who, if I was elected, I understand that I don't know what I don't know. So therefore, doing this podcast, listening to somebody like yourself who obviously knows a lot about a lot of things, okay, um, I would take that on board and then I would just not go, that's too hard. I would say, hey, I don't understand what you're talking about because I've read your paper and I have no idea. All I understand is that we're going to need 5.28, oh, sorry, 5, 528 billion litres of water stored for 30, 30 days of energy um, production for the Snowy Hydro which is a lot of water. But anyway, that was that's a different topic. But I'm saying, but I would understand that um, I don't understand, that you understand, and then I would put you into the guise of the chief scientists and people who do understand, and let's say, let's nut it out and see if this thing's going to work because as far as you're, you've sold me, I'm ready to flick this to um, Malcolm Roberts and say, hey, watch this guy and maybe speak to him because I think we should be not worrying about... Um, fake renewable energy we should we should be um trying to fish 
the garbage island and bring it to Australia so we can turn it into liquid fuel. Now, let's, uh, you've just, and I was waiting for you to finish because uh, 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 I, I do have this habit of leaping in in my enthusiasm. Um, you mentioned Malcolm Roberts, a star, an absolute star. He's one of the, one of the exceptions. So is Senator Jared Rennick and yes. Alex Antic. We have, yet yeah, they stand out. They stand out like diamonds in the rough, these guys, but they get nowhere. Craig Kelly was, was absolutely on target with regard to COVID and with regard to the uh, climate change scam. And look what happened to him, right? The, the, our system of government was never intended to be where it is. It was developed, it came really to its, to its peak during the time of Queen Victoria. The, the Prime Minister was the first amongst equals. The Prime Minister was supposed to be the equivalent of the chairman of the board. The cabinet ministers were the directors. They reported back to the parliament. Their role was never to control Queen Victoria's departments in detail. She would take greater front at that. Their role was simply to ensure that the will of parliament was actually being carried out by the permanent public service. Now, that has changed. And we, thanks to our media, our media has caused this, and so has Bob Hawke, strongly, strong personalities, become presidents. And now we have the public expecting that the prime minister is actually something akin to a president, when in fact the prime minister is supposed to organise a consensus amongst his fellow cabinet members. He's supposed to be the first amongst equals. He's not supposed to be the boss. This is extremely dangerous because all of these idiots who sit in the cabinet now want to control in detail government departments. And they are very dangerous people. Chris Bowen is an extremely dangerous person. And, and he is wrecking this country's economy. We will end up so far in debt that we can't do the sort of things that you asked me, Stephen, to dream about about 15 minutes back at our conversation, which I'd love to talk about. Yes. We get, there are so many interesting things to talk about. But I would love uh, to come back and, and, and I'd love to give you a, a paper beforehand which would form the basis for a focused discussion, but I would love to talk to you and your listeners about how bad our system of government it is, how dangerous it is, and how we are all in grave peril because of the, the way that we came about as a Commonwealth of Australia with six states and two territories. We are in grave danger because it, well, it is being stolen from us. We'll take you up on that offer. We, we, you know, we always looking for, um, you know, guests and stuff like that. We normally have a lineup of guests, but right. um, we do have times where it's hard to find a guest. Um, and honestly, <laughs> it's an emergency, Kev. Can you come? No, on? no. Yeah, will, you'll get a phone call. Right. It's an emergency, Kevin. Um, send us this paper, and we'll read yeah. it, and we'll and we'll lock you in because um, you are a very, very, very interesting gentleman, and. Um, with a lot, a lot of knowledge, and I've got to pick this brain a bit more because I tell you what, I need the plans for this catalytic converter that you're talking about. Um, because oh, we didn't finish that. That's if I might say, the way I always work, and this is what I'm advocating, is what we should do. And and I'm I'm going to write to the government and also write to the chief of the defence force, etc and propose that $20 million is taken out of the defence vote because this is a strategic defence issue. And let me set up a pilot system here in the Ballina Shire with the approval of, and I know I would get the approval from the Mayor of Ballina, Sharon Cadwallader. She's a very good person, very open to new ideas, and they've got nothing to lose by it. But I would like to set up a test facility here where we can very accurately quantify this idea. Now, it may turn out that the 30 cents per litre is, is not possible. There could be gotchas, which we don't know about. Victor Randolph, with the best intention of the world, he, he obviously is biased because his team has developed this. He's full of optimism. And there could be a gotcha that we don't know about. So the very first step is let's just spend a measly $20 million. After all, we spent $400 million on a referendum, right? Surely... We could spend $20 million seeing if we can get ourselves out of a terrible fix we're in. Now, well, Kevin, even if just, to, just, wrong, to cut, just to cut in, yeah, sorry, sorry, because I'm thinking about reasons as to why the 
powers that be don't want this and you said that they've said it's too difficult but it could be is it got to do with maybe there's too there's too many emissions from this or the flip side of that the other end of the spectrum is it we wouldn't need such a reliance on mining any anymore and it would take the heart out of the mining industry is it, is that some no no no, no. Uh, look they let we'll deal with each one of those in a moment but but I'd like to just finish off my final thought on this the the cost of any commodity is related to demand and supply if if things are in short supply demand's high the cost will be high right and that is so in other words even if i'm wrong in my quantification of of how much fuel such an idea would produce it will nevertheless add to supply and it would provide you with an emergency supply which you could ration and use for critical activities such as defense if you ever found yourself in that situation garbage has to be disposed of so the garbage comes to you free of charge it, i mean it's going to have to be transported to the dump anyway so you don't charge that it's got to be buried at present and we'll get to the your emissions business in a moment because i'm leading on to that hmm. but instead of burying it what we do is we put it through this process and we end up with waste that is totally innocuous and only 3% of what it was before. So we're burying stuff or we can recycle it because this ash can then be used in cement. It can be used in road base. There are a multitude of possible uses for the ash coming out the back end of this process. Okay. So, so all I'm now up for is the cost of the process. And Adam, and don't, I, I haven't forgotten your business of emissions, but Adam wants to ask a question. Yes, Adam. Unlike electricity, if we're turning garbage into liquid fuel, and then when we're talking about, Stephen says, you know, mining and excess fuel and all that kind of stuff, liquid fuel can be stored for basically ever, whereas mm -hmm. electricity can't be stored forever because it depletes. So yeah. you could throw your stupid batteries out. You can to convert all the garbage we have, which is an issue. We can save the bloody turtles from the plastic straws. Okay. And, and also you're not Store going to as um, toxify the water table, which is what we're doing right at this moment. When we bury it in the earth, we have no idea where the hell that's going to leach. Oh, sorry, goes. Adam, I cut you off. No, no. I just had to... Put that Perfect. In. No, that's fine. This is why it's open platform so we can do this because then so then we could so let's forget storing electricity. Let's just start converting garbage into liquid fuel and let's just start storing liquid fuel because guess yes. what? That can just stay there forever and if we need it in 50 years, we can use it in 50 years. I've got a jerry can of petrol for my lawnmower. It's been here for 10 years. I pay someone to cut my grass now, but I had to cut the grass the other day and I just pulled it out and it still worked. Not it wasn't the greatest, but it still worked. So who cares? So so now dealing with the emissions question, any organic matter when it decomposes, it turns into methane and carbon dioxide. Okay, typically, or nitrous oxide, or some other nasty like uh, hydrogen sulfide or sulfur dioxide. But they all break down. Whereas in this process, it's totally controlled. It happens in a negatively pressured building so that nothing escapes the building. Um, mm. And you're turning it into a pure fuel which has no contaminants in it. So when the fuel is burnt, you don't end up with sulfur dioxide or other nasties entering your atmosphere, which happens with natural fuels. So, so that deals with the emissions side of the house. Next, we deal with emissions full stop. And, and if, we, if this program goes long enough, I will show you conclusively that there is no way within the laws of physics or thermodynamics that carbon dioxide or methane can appreciably warm the Earth's atmosphere. And I've got real life data that I will challenge anybody to you know, uh, debunk that shows that the Earth's atmosphere has been cooling for 8,000 years approximately uh, at the same time as CO2 concentration in the atmosphere has been rising. So riddle me this, if, if CO2 warms the atmosphere, how come the atmosphere is cooling? Now, the next thing of this is over the last 140 years, you may be surprised to know that the on, in fits and starts, the Earth's atmosphere has been cooling. You may have heard people say it's risen by one and a half. That's, that's not true. That is absolutely not true. And what's more, 
I can show you examples of where they have fraudulently played with the measurement of temperature to come to that one and a half degrees. It is all fraud. It is one huge fraud. And as I've said previously to you, the thing that I most worries me about what's going on is that something which is so blatantly wrong, something which is such a huge, humongous scientific lie could get traction and have intelligent people really believing this and totally wrecking the Western economy to the benefit of the Chinese Communist Party. And that's that's the end beneficiary of this, the Chinese Communist Party. And but that's what do we're doing. We're actually destroying ourselves. How, how do you react when the the Attorney General of the, the UN gets up and says, we're now moving into the era of global boiling? How do he, you... he is an absolute and abject fool. There's no if, buts or maybes. Look, I, I can. I, I wonder if we can do this. Can we share a, a screen? Uh, yeah, you can but, have it. You should be able to. Okay, I, I just I, I need you to to allow me to, but I'm looking to see where sharing yeah, screen down, is. That down the is. bottom, you should have present. Yes, I have. Oh, is that what I was yeah. looking for? Share screen. Yeah, Very good. Share click screen. That, it should say share screen. Yeah. And and I'm going to say share screen. Yep. And oh, select window of screen. That's it's making life easy, interesting. Ex candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. Hold on a second. It, I, I closed it, so I will open it again. And uh, I'll just I'll just say while while Kevin's looking for that, I'll put the link in the chat if you if anyone wants to uh, to call in and ask a question. Um, yeah, because we've got Sash, we've got some good questions here. What percentage? Yeah, lots of, of good questions in the chat. You know, but... and then we've had Tony as well. We know Tony doesn't come on. That's all right. She might be sitting in the bars with her bottle of champagne like last time. <laughs> um, and then we've got. Um, uh, but Graham's putting some good comments too that I've put up on the screen. So, um, yeah, you know, like ring in. Yeah, we want to hear um, from you. Join the yeah, conversation. Pick Kevin's brain. This is awesome. Um, it, it, this is – sorry, this is a new interface that I'm dealing with. If I'd uh, – oh, damn you. I'm just trying yeah, to, right. to work out how <laughs> – how we can get out of this. Um, oh, here we go. It's taken me back now. My apologies, guys. It's all good. Uh, okay. I still don't know how to use it properly. That's why I don't share screens. Yeah, entire screen. All right, let's just try. Ah, okay. Uh, this is this is not working, guys. Look, I'll, I'll read it out to you, and now I'm trying to work out how the hell to That's get right. back to. Is this on your website, is it, or? No, it's a presentation that I've done, and um, I wanted to to show it to you. and And this interface is hopeless. Um, when I say that, I'm just not skilled in it. If we were using <laughs> Zoom, I would. But look, um, I'll go back to what I was looking at. Now, the I, I say here the driving motivation, and this is from Doctor Otmar Endenhofer. I think I can add it up to the stage. There we go. Is that it? Can you see it? The driving motivation? It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We redistribute de facto the world's wealth by climate policy. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. That's what's going on. And that's yeah. when, they, when the guy in the UN or wherever stands up and says that, I just say, this guy is a crook, he's a Marxist, he's a commie. He, he's bent, he's corrupt, and he's an idiot. Because he's an idiot in as much as at the end of every revolution, all of the influences are lined up against a wall and shot by the victor. And the victor in this case will be the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah. So so he's he's got a short history ahead of him. Kevin, um, okay. just, to, just to finish up, because we're, we're getting towards the end and we're we will sure. have you back. Graham said that we should have you back, and so is Tony, and I'm sure a lot of the people watching. And they've agree. all bookmarked your. They've all yep. bookmarked your website. They're all they're all into your website already, so <laughs> <laughs> finding all the information there. But I want to finish up, and I, I can't let you go before asking you about water and drought proofing Australia. Yes. What are your thoughts yes. on that? Oh, look, we we could that. I'll drop back to a to a basic fundamental. This country has lots of water. It's just that, unfortunately, it falls in the wrong places or falls too much in the wrong places. Now, I live in a place where we get three metres of water a year. And, in fact, 
I came within five millimetres of my house being flooded and the water was uh, 2.615 metres above uh, mean tide level. That uh, We had wow. two point, and it ran for around about 30 kilometres, by the way, this level of water around me, and that happened in March of 2022. Mm. Um, if we could take responsible amounts of water from the eastern seaboard and divert it to the west, we would increase our farmland by at least three times. We would we wouldn't drought proof ourselves. We we would um, we would nevertheless ameliorate the effect of drought. We most probably would moderate extremes in climate by having lots of precipitation happening on the western side of the range, which would take up a lot of energy. Um, we would create a localized natural water cycle happening on the western side of the range. This was conceived by a, a brilliant chap called Bradfield, Bradfield and, and other people who were associated with him back in the 30s. And I've already said it's just absolutely marvellous to think that these people came up with this scheme when they were armed with, with horses and mules and theodolites strapped to packs, and they yeah. came up with stuff which we cannot fault today. But Tully receives an unbelievable amount of water up in Queensland, and it would be very easy, certainly for the amount of money we're presently wasting on these unreliable systems of, of power generation. If we, do, if we use that money to responsibly divert money, to divert water from the eastern seaboard into the west, it would do amazing things for this country. And interestingly, when I was the engineering superintendent on North Stradbroke Island, uh, our uh, chaplain, our uh, Anglican priest, was a fellow called Kit, Bun Kit Bunker, and he was a geophysicist. And he had developed a new way of boring into rock, which used only one-tenth the amount of energy, roughly one-tenth the amount of energy. It's a brilliant idea, and he demonstrated it to me. I went over to the University of St. Lucia and had a look at it. Um, it would be possible for us very cheaply to bore a two-metre pipe through the ranges using modern tunnel boring technology. And as you go, you, you have precast concrete sections which you raise, you expand outwards, and then you put a keystone into them. You just simply put a grout into them. So you can actually bore maybe two or three kilometres a day using this system, wow. and you could go straight through the ranges to take a two-metre pipe from the, from the eastern seaboard across to the west. And then by, by really quite cheap canals, you can divert water from the Clarence and the Richmond as one example. But there are, there are a ton of rivers all the way down the east coast of Australia that at times go into floods. And at that time, you could divert the water. And it would do the environment a lot of good because flooding rips away the riverbanks yes. and causes excess sedimentation. It also yes. disturbs the uh, aquatic life and so forth. You've got to keep a good flow running in the streams. I'm not suggesting that you denude it entirely, but we could control the flow in the streams in the eastern seaboard such that they are most beneficial to aquatic life and nature in general. And at the same time, we could be moving useful amounts of water into the west. This would this would uh, keep the Murray Darling system refreshed, and all of the people would you know it would greatly reduce the cost of water on the western side, mm. uh, which would be to the benefit of everybody. Well, you can't have and that because it's all privatised now. Oh, you can't have that. Well, <laughs> now, now, you're, now, out. now you're moving into another thing, which which I get really upset about, and <laughs> and once yeah. again, it's because you've got idiots in control. That yeah, what but, they have done is is nothing less than vandalism. It, it, well, it's 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 more than that. It's almost criminal. But th to, to move to move this water, would it be more gravity fed? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, yes. So gravity does it, the it work. Could be, it could be. Yeah, gravity does the work. And, no, and interestingly, if if you wanted to, you could use nuclear or or coal fired power stations <coughs> during off peak to pump water up to reservoirs and then let it run down the west uh, and generate electricity during peak times to augment. And if you can do that, if you can run your base load facilities at near to 100% capacity 100% of the time, you can produce electricity at about 2.5 cents to 3 cents a kilowatt hour. That's how we had the cheapest electricity in the world in 2007 before that fat, useless I won't use the word we're on. This is a children's show uh, called Rudd came onto the scene. 
man. Kevin O's Edmund. I, I, I read an article uh, from Matthew Warren uh, the other day, and he was talking about this issue with all the solar panels on people's roofs these days. In the middle of the day, it's producing so much electricity and putting that back into the grid that there's an yes. excess of electricity. But the problem is yes. you can't turn off coal power stations because no. it takes them too long to be turned on. And, they, and we need them for night at night when the sun's not shining. So the problem is that there's so much electricity in the grid, it's taking the wholesale price of electricity below zero, which is, inc which is increasing the cost of electricity. So, yes, so I was about to say that's because of an artificial costing model. You know, it works on the idea that if you've got a ton of electricity, if you reduce the cost, more people will use that electricity. That's the whole idea of the. That's why we got into peak and off peak. It wasn't because there's any sort of economic justification to it in, 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 in prima facie. But if you charge more for electricity, people will work out ways of either not using it at that time or using less. And that's the whole. That was the whole raison d'etre of that. But um, what they have to do is dump the electricity into the ground. And, and while you're not generating electricity with your baseload facilities, you're still paying for them. They're still staffed with people. Um, you, you know, you've got to get a return on your investment. And so, as you say, the cost of electricity goes up. It's gone up, by the way, nearly seven times by the CPI since 2007. <laughs> Even if you have a solar system on your roof, you are paying three times more for your electricity now than you were back in 2007, before you had to outlay $5,000 to get that monstrosity onto your roof. <laughs> it, it's unbelievable. I mean, the stupidity of people is just gobsmacking. They, they truly are village idiots and they're running the country. They have far too much power. Right. That's not the way that our democracy is supposed to work. No, you're, That's, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, just to finish up on water, Graham's asking, uh, there's a proposal in the by the Queensland State Government regarding the Australian Artinian Basin. Um, when we talk about the Bradfield scheme, are there, are there good designs that have been produced for this to, to divert water from uh, high uh, rainfall areas into the Murray-Darling? Like, are they, do these plans absolutely. exist? Absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. No, this has all been this has well and truly all been worked out. That they, <coughs> the guys back in the '30s were brilliant, and and they weren't bound by wokeism and crap. You know, they 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 weren't talking about you know traditional owners and all this other garbage which has been invented to completely stuff this country. Hmm. That's all this is about. I mean, but, it's just ludicrous what we're doing to ourselves. So in the in the 1930s, when these guys came up with the Bradford hybrid scheme and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it would have been from them walking the planes and traveling the planes and yes, visually yes. seeing it, having an, having, having an engineering mind, but it would have basically been like, Hey, wait a second. If we drill holes through here and we funnel water this way and we do this, do that gravity does the work. It's kind of like common sense. It's a common sense kind of thing. So it seems to me a, a more simple way of, you know, doing things than the complex ways that they're wasting all our money on now. Uh, you, yeah. know, if, you know, if, if you can visually see it work or you can visually um, imagine how it's going to work, you can kind of nut out 90% of the issues there. You're only coming up with your issues that you might get, you know, if you hit iron or something through the through the centre of the, the, uh, the Great Dividing Range. Well, I'd like to talk to you about Kit Bunker's invention one day because it is truly brilliant. Uh, yeah. But anyway, yeah, it overcomes all of those problems. Wow. All right, Stephen, you've got to ask our special guest his question, our, our question. We have, we have a final segment on the show, and you, you answered it partly before, but it's called Build Your I'm Own Fantasy. they're all idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Build Your Own Fantasy Government. Now, Kevin, you're in charge of the next government or the next parliament of Australia, and you can choose five or six people to head up the next government of Australia. Now, they can be current politicians, former politicians, uh, experts in a particular field. Some people choose dead people, uh, whatever you whatever you like. But it's up to you, five or six people, to head up the next government of Australia. Who would I choose for the five yes. or six people? Who yeah. would you choose? Well, well Jared Rennick would have to sit high. Malcolm Roberts, definitely. Um, Craig Kelly um, and Alex Antic. <laughs> and it would be wrong for me not to say Pauline Hanson, 
Pauline is, is somebody who um, is extremely, you know, has a, a great deal of common sense. She's extremely courageous. Her downfall is that she's not terribly articulate, um, mm. but she is a she's a really decent person, and she's got a wise head on her shoulders. She's got a lot of common sense. Uh, <laughs> so they're the they're they're the people that I would pick just straight off. But but look, if I can. I, I really believe the very first, and if you go to my ideas and opinions, you'll find this. I really believe that we ought to be looking firstly at how we can improve the quality of voters. And and by that, I'm, I'm not talking about ex- restricting people from being able to vote. I'm talking about the way we conduct elections. And, and we ought to work out a way that we can get more participation from people. I know they have to vote compulsorily. But that doesn't mean that they cast a considered vote. Um, and I go into in in my um, in there. You'll see. I think if you if you go to ideas and opinions, and have you gone to that? I can't uh, election well, reform. Le- yeah, election reform. Yeah. yeah. If you have a read of that, and that's only the beginning of it. I've got other ideas which I don't wish to share at this moment. There, I'm actually in talks with people. But um, that's the very first thing. The second thing we need to do is look at the constitutions of the states and the territories. Though The constitutions of the states were based upon the Constitution of New South Wales, which was passed by the Constitution Act of 18, 1855 in the British Parliament. It was constructed by William Wentworth and the governor of the day, and it pays no attention to the rights of citizens, and it has a completely arse about face. You, you must start with a constitution saying that the constitution is owned by the people. And you must ensure that parliamentarians never get near the Constitution. In other words, we should not have to ask a prime minister to agree to a referendum. The people should demand that there be a referendum. Because if you trust politicians to to hold referendums only when they think it's important, then they, they are controlling something which is absolutely essential to proper governance of this country. Now, you would be most probably not surprised to know that the state constitutions can be altered by the parliamentarians. The people of Queensland actually voted in a referendum uh, in about the uh, 1920 not to abolish the upper house. But Premier, I think his name was Theodore, and with um, Governor Gould, they conspired together, two Labor chaps, and the governor appointed 13 Labor people to the Legislative Council, which he was allowed to do in those days, And it was agreed that once they were appointed, they would then vote to dissolve the upper house. We have a real problem. The reason we have a bicameral system is to stop capricious government. In other words, you don't have a sudden rush of blood to the head and enact it. Mm -hmm. The the upper house is supposed to be a house of review. But political parties now short circuit that. A strong political party in both the upper and the lower house means that you have no proper review any longer. The Governor General and the Governors are simply tokens. They are gormless, spineless tokens who do exactly as they're told. They're there for feel good and warm and fuzzy when in fact they're supposed to be the Chief Executive of the Executive Arm of Government. They are supposed to be the ones who select who will be the heads of departments and they don't. Uh, and I'm getting, this is the sort of thing I would like to talk about. But but coming back to your question, that's what you've got to reform. These are strategic things. If you fix those, then the other things will automatically get fixed. If you can improve the quality of your voters, in other words, your voters are voting knowing what they're voting for and who they're voting for, then you will get better people into parliament. If you get better people into parliament, you'll get better decisions. If you can put the proper checks if you can have an upper house that truly is a house of review and if you can have a governor general and a governor who are popularly elected and who are answerable directly to the people and the criteria for their selection is on how well they would run a business, not whether they're politicians. This is where it all goes ass about face again. You do not want a president who is a politician. The, you've, got a, you've got a legislature that is full of politicians and that's bad enough. But they're they're a necessary evil. You have to have the legislature. But you need a chief executive who will run a business. And this country is a business. And that's where it all falls down. So anyway, that so that's what I would do there. Then we get into the energy side of the house. I 
I have all sorts of ideas as to how I could promote small business. And believe me, our salvation, our economic salvation lies in small business and private ownership and honoring ownership. In other words, you don't allow councils to rezone properties helter-skelter and diminish the value of properties unless they're also prepared to compensate the owners of that property for the loss they have incurred. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is really basic. A basic tenet of any robust, functioning, sustainable democracy is property, that you honour people's right to property, that they are allowed to keep what they earn. Socialism works in exactly the opposite direction. Socialism is all about collectivism. And because people don't willingly give up what they have worked hard to earn, you then resort to authoritarianism. And that's yeah. why every socialist regime in history has ended up killing millions of its own citizens because people do not willingly go down that road once, once they're confronted with it. You have silly, stupid, starry-eyed students from university thinking that, oh, this is the way to go. But once you get into it, it's hell on earth. They say people vote their way into socialism and then have to shoot their way out of it. Yes. That's where yeah. we're heading right at this moment. Yeah. Well, That's you, a, you, I, I could go on for ages. And I best that was really good to end on. Say that saying again. People it's vote, their, people way vote in their way into socialism and then they have to shoot their way out of it. And by the way, the Greens are Marxists and, and the Labor are fascists. They are quintessential fascists. And I can go into that at some later thing. But I, I'm sure a lot of people who are Labor acolytes are offended by what I'm saying, but I can back up my claim. Labor is a fascist government. They are in bed with big business. You cannot have big unions unless you have big business. And that's what Labor's all about. They're so far up the anus of big business that they can't see daylight. <laughs> Well, look, you've been, you've been you've been amazing. You've been fantastic tonight, Kevin. I really love the the ones the guests that we have on that teach us something. Yeah. And I feel like you we've only just scratched the surface with you, or just the tip of the iceberg. So what we might do is we might take all the issues you discuss and put them in a hat, and we'll just draw one out for next time, <laughs> and uh, and we'll go with. And that. we'll try but, and stay on subject. Oh, that's all right. Uh, well, you know that's 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 part of the fun, right? So. Uh, no, I really really it and I'm very, very grateful for you giving me this opportunity to stand on a soapbox in the park and render forth. So thank you very, very much. It's been great no, fun. Thank you. No problem at all. Now, for people out there that want to follow you, is your website the best way? Uh, yeah, and also uh, Kevin L at KevinLockray.com. And you'll find also that there's Kevin Lockray for Ballina, which could well turn into Kevin Lockray for Richmond. Ballina is Ballina electorate, and I may run for the seat of Richmond, but I would really like to run for the Senate. And so mm. you guys could help me with that by getting me known to everybody in New South Wales because I need 800,000 votes to get into the Senate. If I was in Tasmania, it would be a doddle. i just have to show up on the day <laughs> but, uh, you know, for the four people in Tasmania to vote for me. But That's, that, um, that's funny yeah. you say that because someone explained the state system in Tasmania to me the other day. And it's a quota system. I'm like, like anyone could should just be able to walk into parliament based on that. Yeah, yeah, and they do. Yeah. You only have to look at what comes out of Tasmania to see that. It's, and, and you know, the likes of Olivia Thorpe being a, a senator is is truly frightening. Ah, oh, that's true. Well, Kevin, we will have you back on. Uh, we might discuss that off air on, on the frequency of having you on. But uh, thank you very much for coming on tonight. And for everyone that's watching, uh, please share this out. I, I think there was a lot of information, especially the garbage uh, idea. The gar what, what's the actual technical name for that system, Kevin? Uh, I don't. Well, all I can say is it's technology developed by the University of Queensland. It's catalytic conversion technology. Okay. They use they develop specialist catalysts which allow you to basically you take all the, the waste, you separate if you want to, those things which are useful using, uh, you know, ferrous and non-ferrous separation techniques and glass. And then all the, basically the rest goes down a big pipe uh, lined with um, manganese dioxide to be turned into uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Uh, it, if, as I say, if you go and have a look at my website and inspired by this talk, I will actually add to that that paper in in the very near future because awesome. there's a, another part of it where i talk about how to how we'd actually do this it's called turning crap into fuel that's all you need to know that's all you need to know yeah. who cares yeah, about yeah. 
Well, well, <laughs> share, share that out to, to everyone for, for those that are, that are watching. Also, if you uh, if you want to support us, you can jump on to buy me a coffee. I've put the link in the uh, in the chat, and I will let everyone know that next week we might not be available on uh, Sunday night. We are uh, hoping to see Donald Trump Jr. for <laughs> hope they don't postpone. If you don't it cancel again. him again. If they don't cancel yeah, again. I, so we might. Yeah, we yeah, might have is to that come. next Sunday night. It should that be next be Sunday. Night. Yeah. So uh, either we'll, we'll, we'll have to do. That. We'll have to do Saturday night or Sunday afternoon, but I'll let everyone know on Facebook. But for everyone that has watched tonight, thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Adam. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. See ya. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Adam. Cheers, mate. Thanks.